me take a moment to talk about my life outside of Simmons, or in some cases, spinning off from Simmons. The great American literary journal, Plowshares, actually took some of its earliest steps. Where's the way? Actually took some of its earliest steps when three people teaching English at Simmons in 1971, myself, DeWitt Henry, present today, and Norman Klein, whose wife is, ex-wife is now actually working at Simmons in library acquisitions. It goes around and comes around. The three of us <laughs> form a kind of editorial core right here in 300 the Fenway. In a really dumb move by Simmons, we rushed off a chance to have plowshares, plowshares housed here at the college. It would have been a feather in our caps. Instead, it's plowshares at Emerson College. I kept up my links with the magazine over the years and recently published a short story there entitled Fort Macon about race and sex in the 1960s North Carolina. Both while I was directing drama at Simmons and long after I've tried to keep my, active, my acting career alive. In the 70s, I did a couple of shows with Harpo, a company directed by the formidable Lawrence Sunlay. For many years in the 80s and 90s, I was literary director of the Reborn Poets Theater, where I acted, directed, and wrote a play about South Africa that was produced at the ICA. More recently, I've been acting with the Actors Shakespeare Project last year, playing Alonzo in The Tempest with the great Calvin Epstein. Having inherited Wiley Cipher's big undergraduate Shakespeare course, teaching the bard and acting in his plays sometimes feels like a single, seamless action. In the mid-80s, I joined another Back from the Dead organization, <laughs> Bath Gotten, the Boston area faculty group on public issues which had been founded in the 1950s by George Kistukowski at MIT to oppose nuclear proliferation. In the 80s, led by Nobel laureate Salvador Luria, also of MIT, Bath Gottlieb's focus was on the US role supporting repressive governments and paramilitary death squads in Central America. At one point, I suggested to the group that we send every member of Congress a copy of US Assistant Attorney Reed Brody's book of appalling eyewitness affidavits entitled Contra Terror in Nicaragua. As I recall, that exhausted our budget. <laughs> but at least for a while, thanks in part to the persistence of the Massachusetts congressional delegation, aid to the mercenary butchers known as the Contras, that group that President Reagan called the moral equivalent of our founding fathers, <laughs> remained illegal. <coughs> Math copy dif disappeared for a while, but in 2004, my colleges of the Fenway colleague, George Katsifikis of Wentworth, and I revived the name to confront the Boston police after Emerson College student Victoria Snowgrove was killed by a so-called non-lethal crowd control weapon. We were and still are troubled by the post-9-11 militarization of America's police forces and by the preemptive use of crowd control methods. As are the members of what we loosely call our left study group, scholars, intellectuals and activists from around Boston who have met once a month for over a decade to discuss radical texts and eat decadent desserts. <laughs> Some of them are here today, and I want to give them what Sarah Palin would call a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to have access to a critical mass of political soulmates is one of the reasons it's so great living and teaching. The mention of Nicaragua and the Contras brings me to the final section of my reflections on 42 years at Simmons. I'm a little stunned to realize that for over half my time at Simmons, I have been involved with Nicaragua and have increasingly tried to interweave my work in Nicaragua with my life at Simmons. <coughs> it began with a chance invitation from my friend Steve Chinlin, an Episcopal priest with a long history of involvement in progressive social movements. He wanted to know if I'd go down with him to Nicaragua to, quote, check out that revolution of theirs, the one full of liberation theology priests. We went down, this must have been the years of 1986, and it changed my life forever. Among the people we met was the great poet and priest Ernesto Cardinal, who was, at that point, the Minister of Culture for the revolutionary government of Daniel Ortega. Although it is worth pointing out that these days, Ernesto is one of Ortega's harshest critics. I should also point out that I first came across Ernesto Cardinal's name in a bilingual anthology called Revolutionary Latin American Poetry that Jennifer Rose gave me when she graduated. 
<laughs> Ernesto had lived for most of the 1970s in an isolated archipelago of islands in Lake Nicaragua called Solentinami. I had been reading an anthology of poems by newly literate Solentinami campesinos or peasants. Ernesto had taught them to read using the Gospels as their primer. Ernesto and I agreed that I would write a book about the poetry workshop that followed the flowering of literacy in Solentinami. Back at Simmons, I was awarded a Simmons College Fund for Research Grant and returned the following winter to conduct research for the first of my three books about Nicaragua. My first book was called Nicaraguan Peasant Poetry from Solentinami. Each of these books has been supported by grants from Simmons. Two other developments during this period were cru crucial to my intellectual and political evolution. Thanks to our generous alumna, Joan Warburg, we now have a fascinating stream of diplomats, scholars, and activists coming through Simmons for two years' stints. One of the first, perhaps the first, Warburg Professor of International Relations was former ambassador to El Salvador, Robert White. Ambassador White's the other Bob White. <laughs> my my, I don't know. Ambassador <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, White's brown bag lunches became a running seminar about Central America, and he himself invited guests left, right, and center from the regions, from all the regions of Central America, to speak at Simmons. For me, it was both a revelation and a call to retooling. <clears throat> I read copiously in history and political theory and became an avid Central America buff. Not that it meant turning my back on literature. An extraordinary number of the key figures in the liberation struggles in Central America were, and still are, writers. The second development was the founding in 1988 of the Newton-San Juan del Sur Sister City Project. I've worked with this group since its inception, returning to Nicaragua every January, like an Oriole or an Iguana, <laughs> the blossoming Madero trees, to build schools and work on public health projects. About 10 years ago, I decided to try to dovetail my Newton work in Nicaragua with my commitment to Simmons. I began, it began with taking down some groups of graduate students in nursing and physical therapy, along with some of their instructors, having them live with families and work side by side with Nicaraguan healthcare providers in the local clinics. These proved to be intense and sometimes life-changing experiences for our students. So about five years ago, I designed a course for undergraduates in the College of Arts and Sciences, students from a variety of disciplines. It has undergone some changes, but it is currently called Interdisciplinary Studies, Interdisciplinary Studies 228, Service Learning in Nicaragua. And I see a number of veterans of that course in the room today. In the fall, we read and discuss a range of topics. Literacy as liberation, following the ideas of the great Brazilian educator, <coughs> Paulo Freire. Liberation theology, short but intense flowering in Latin America before the previous pope asked an assistant of his, who is now the current pope, to shut it down. Water, including the privatization of water systems, and the politics of healthcare. Key figure here is, here is Dr. Paul Farmer and his savage indignation against the unequal distribution of quality health care between rich and poor. Alternative models of economic development, alternative that is, to the now discredited pieties of the World Bank and the IMF. <coughs> and finally, an unflinching look at the struggle between Nicaraguan feminists and the entrenched culture of machismo, along with the concomitant evils of domestic violence, rape, and sex trafficking. Then in <coughs> January, between semesters, my students and I, traveling along with the nursing and PT grad students and their instructors, and Jim Christopherson and his one of the leaders of the nursing instructors these days. We spent two and a half weeks in Nicaragua, complete with home stays, field work, and community service volunteering. Only those with conversational Spanish are accepted in my course. We're talking total immersion. On their return, they write a big synthetic essay based both on scholarly research and personal experience. 